Hi, welcome back. In this session, I'd like to talk a little bit about estimating the cost of equity and cost of capital for a privately owned business. You see, what's the big deal about a privately owned business? Much of what we know, most of the models and practices we have in corporate finance were designed for publicly traded companies. And for publicly traded companies, the cost of equity and capital are built on two bedrock principles. The first is that the marginal investor in the company, marginal investor is the investor who owns a lot of stock and trades that stock, is diversified. And for publicly traded companies, that's not a bad assumption because the investors own a lot of stock and trade that stock tend to be institutional investors. That diversified investor assumption allows us to focus just on the risk that cannot be diversified away, the market risk, and capture it with a beta in the CAPM and betas in the arbitrage pricing model or multi-factor models, but they all share the basic premise. The only risk you should be building into your cost of equity is the risk you cannot diversify away. The other bedrock principle is that market values are observable. The cost of capital is a market value concept. It's a cost of raising money in the market today. So we use market values of equity and market values of debt. And for a publicly traded company, at least the market value of equity should be observable. And the market value of debt, you can at least get a judgment on what that number should be. Now let's look at what the difficulty of private business is. There are two basic challenges. The first is the owner of a private business tends not to be diversified. And potential buyers also tend not to be diversified. You think, why would they be so stupid not to diversify? Because they don't have the money. If you run a private business, every dollar of your wealth is often channeled into that business. You don't have a chance to be diversified. So the assumption of the diversified investor breaks down. The other is with private businesses, there is no market value. You can get a book value of equity and debt, but it's often a meaningless number because it's affected by all the accounting choices you make. So here are the potential fixes. If you look at the implications of using public company models and private businesses, you're going to underestimate the cost of equity with the traditional beta or betas because you're focusing just on the risk that cannot be diversified away. And a private business owner is exposed to most of that company specific risk that you're assuming away. So the fix is you need to bring into your cost of equity the risk that you were previously assuming would be diversified away. With the market value problem, because you don't have market values, you have to estimate market values of equity and debt for a private company. Neither of these challenges are insurmountable. So I'm going to use a very simple example to illustrate how I'm going to get around them. Let's set up a very simple algebra problem. Let's assume you have a company with 100 units of risk. Let's assume that in this company, 80 units of the risk, risk are company-specific risk and 20 units are market risk, risk you cannot diversify away. In a traditional CAPM or arbitrage pricing model or multi-factor model, what we focus on is on the 20 units of risk and we try to come up with proxies, measures of that market risk. Now think about the algebra problem you're facing with a private company. With a private company with a completely undiversified investor, when he or she looks at this business, he sees not 20 units of risk, but 100 units of risk. So at least in principle, the risk he, should see, he or she should see in this business is five times higher. You see why five times higher? Because the market risk captures 20 units of risk and you are exposed to all 100 units. So if I can somehow come up with a way of estimating how much of the risk in a company is company specific, I should be able to adjust my beta for that risk. And there is a way to do this. Let me take you back to the way we get market betas for cost of equity in a traditional cap app. We run a regression, right, of returns in the stock against returns in the market index. Now we've used this regression before and the number we focused on was the regression beta. We said that if you trust the regression, is a measure of the risk that you cannot diversify away. But if you stay on the regression and work down, you see an R squared number. You're saying, what is that? Statistically, the R squared explains the proportion of the risk in your dependent variable, which in this case is the company that is explained by the market. Think about it. The R squared tells you the proportion of the variance in your stock that is explained by the market. In fact, if you take the square root of the R squared, you get the correlation. The correlation tells you the percentage of the standard deviation in your stock that comes from the market. Hold on to that thought, because I'm going to use that as my proxy for figuring out how to get to a measure of a private company cost of equity. Start with the market beta for your private company. So if you have an apparel company, for instance, start looking at a privately owned apparel company. Start by looking at the 
at the betas of publicly traded companies in that space, apparel companies. You get a market beta. You say, but I'm not diversified. Hold on. Second, from the same regressions you got the betas for those apparel, publicly traded apparel companies, look up those correlations that we just looked at on that regression beta page for each of the companies. Come up with an average correlation across apparel companies. So here's what you have. You have an average market beta and an average correlation. Make that market beta an unlevered beta because we have to deal with that separately. So the unlevered, you have the unlevered beta of publicly traded apparel companies and the average correlation of an apparel company to the market. So let's say we took the 2008 data. This is what the numbers would have looked like. The unlevered beta for apparel companies was 0 0.81. The, the debt to equity ratio, the average, I'm sorry, the average correlation of apparel companies to the market was 0.25. That's to an algebra problem. If you are a completely diversified investor, the risk you would see won't be the market beta, 0.81. If you're a completely undiversified investor, you have all your money tied up in this apparel business, you're going to see 0.81 divided by 0.25, four times as much risk, or a non-levered beta of 3.24. Now, of course, this holds only if you're completely undiversified. If you're partially diversified, you how would that happen? Let's say the private business owner has enough wealth that he can invest in an index fund on the side. And he has only a third of his money in this, in this, in this company and two thirds in the index fund. He's not completely diversified because he's got too much in the private company, but he's still getting a little bit closer to being fully diversified. You will use a number between 0.81 and 3.24. You think, how do I know what that number is? What you'll have to do is compute the correlation of your owner's portfolio, which now includes a private business and that index fund with the market. And that correlation will be higher than 0.25. So there is a way in which you can adjust the beta for partially diversified investors. And that might be the technique used for a VC or a private equity investor in this company. So that's the technique I'm going to use to adjust my beta for the fact that you're not completely diversified. You think, what do I do about the fact that I have no market value? There are three fixes. The first is you can ask the owner of a private business whether he or she has a target debt ratio. To be honest, I've never been able to find a private business owner who's been able to give me a number that I can actually use. But once in a while, you might get a private business owner who says, look, my target debt ratio is 25%. Make sure that that target debt ratio is in terms of overall value. But there is a scenario where this might give you an answer. Let's suppose the private business owner says, look, I hate debt. I will never borrow money. Your target debt ratio is 0%. Your life got a lot simpler. So if you can get a target debt ratio, use it. But as I said, tough to do. The second is to look at the industry average debt ratios of publicly traded companies in the space. What you're implicitly assuming here is if a typical retail company has 50% debt, 50% equity, a private company is in a sense operate by the same rules. You use the industry average. There's a third choice. You can try to estimate the market value of equity and debt in your private company. You're saying, how am I going to do that? You could try to apply a multiple. For instance, if you know what the net income of your private business, let's say it's 10 million, and a typical publicly traded company trades at 20 times earnings, 20 times 10 million is 200 million. You're saying, that's so back of the envelope. All you want is an estimate. You can use that estimate. There's also a tricky way in which you can use your own estimated values from a DCF valuation as your weights in the cost of capital your estimated values of equity and debt. I'll warn you though, it'll create a circular reasoning problem because you need the values of equity and debt to get the cost of capital and need the cost of capital to get the value. But the fix to it is if you're using an Excel spreadsheet, you can check off the iteration box and it's almost magical because your estimated values then give you the weights. So those are your solutions. Hold on and think about which one you're going to use. With my apparel company that I've been using, I'm going to use the industry average ratio. So the total unlevered beta for the company is 3.24. The average debt to equity ratio of publicly traded apparel companies is 34.18%. I'm going to assume that my privately owned business, the apparel business, is going to have roughly the same debt to equity ratio. I'm going to use a tax rate of 40% reflecting the fact that a private business owner gets taxed often at a different tax rate than a publicly traded company. And this is true in the U.S. in 2018. So let's say the tax rate is 40%. So if I bring those numbers together, unlevered beta of 3.24, 40% tax rate, 34.18% debt to equity ratio, the levered beta that I get is 3.90. My risk-free rate is 2.5%, my equity risk premium is 5%. Those are computed exactly the same way for a private company as for a public company. My cost of equity for this private company is 21.9%.
surprisingly high, right? In fact, to just give you a sense of how much of a hill you will have to climb as a private business, a public company in the same space with that same debt to equity ratio, an unlevered beta, the market beta 0.81, and a tax rate of 24%, the marginal tax rate for public companies in the US in 2018 would have had a beta 1.02 and a cost of equity of 7.6%. Now you can see why when private business and public companies compete in the same space, why it's so difficult for privately owned companies to kind of fight the good fight. So I've got a cost of equity. Let me complete the story by talking about cost of capital. Remember the old point that I made about cost of debt with a public company? That the cost of debt for a publicly traded company should be the rate at which you can borrow mo money long term today. I'm going to stick with that same definition. Do not use a book interest rate just because you're using a private company. To get that long term current cost of debt, I'm actually going to use the same technique I use with public companies that don't have a rating. I'm going to compute a synthetic rating based on an interest coverage ratio. You're saying, can you do that? Sure, because ultimately the interest coverage ratio just measures how much risk lenders feel when you, they look at your company and see your capacity to make your interest payments. With my privately owned apparel company, that interest coverage ratio gives me a synthetic rating of triple B. Using that rating and the default spread that goes with that rating, I come up with a default spread of 1.25%, which if added to my risk-free rate of 2.5%, gives me a pre-tax cost of debt of 3.75%. Now, if you feel that private companies will have to pay an additional additional interest rate because they're private and the bank kind of holds all the cards, you can add an extra percent or, or no, one point or 1.5% 1 to this number, but I'm going to stick with the 3.75%. I would stay with the same debt ratio choice that I made to get my levered beta because remember I used an industry average. I'm going to stay with the industry average. That industry average debt to capital ratio, 25.47%, which incidentally is, con is consistent with my debt to equity ratio of 34.18%, gives me a cost of capital for the private company. It's my 21.9% cost of equity computed from the total beta times the weight of equity, which is 74.53% plus my cost of debt, 3.75%, net of that 40% tax benefit. And here my higher tax rate does help me times the weight of debt gives me a cost of capital of 16.9%. The public company in this space would have a much lower cost of capital for the reasons we talked about in the context of cost of equity. Now, again, remember, if your private business owner is partially diversified, this penalty, the cost of capital will start to decrease because I'll use a lower beta. But this is the process I go through to get to a cost of equity and cost of capital for a private business. Incidentally, if you're saying, where the heck am I going to get correlations of companies and different business with the market? If you go to my website, I have an estimate, I have a total beta data set where you can look up the total beta for by, by sector. But, and I get the total beta by looking at the market beta and the correlation of companies in that, in that sector with the market. So good luck with that. Thank you very much for listening.